This episode is brought to you by Zencaster. Zencaster is the number one tool for all podcasters. You can record high fidelity audio between remote locations and get studio quality sound. Go to Zencaster.com and use coupon code that entertains for 20% off for three months or 20% off an annual plan. This is a Welcome to this week's edition of Everything is Awesome. I am your host, Kev, and this is the show where we sit down and talk to awesome people about awesome things. Uh, before we get to this week's guest, <clears throat> I just want to give you guys a little preview of what we got coming up in September. This is a new thing I'm trying uh, because I've been recording so far and ahead. I want to give you guys uh, a teaser of the next couple of weeks. We have from Temple of Geek, Daniel Slade. Uh, we have the author of the 90 Day House, Kenzie Bonds. We have Roshni, a yoga instructor from India, and true crime podcaster Lee Purchase from the Slim Turkey Podcast. They're all coming up in the month of September. Also coming up in September is going to be my research uh, of Party of One. We're going to be launching after Party of One, uh, a after talk show that we're going to do on a monthly basis. It's going to be the first Monday of every month. So our first one debuts on October 1st, where we're going to sit down with Jeff Stormer and one other guest. Jeff won't be there every month, but my for the first episode, Jeff's going to be on. We're going to talk about his uh, uh, month of podcasting September and about all the stories and whatnot. But this week we have Liz Anderson, a comedian from Chicago. She runs the monthly The One Woman No Show and is going to be a cast member on the next season of Campaign from the One Shot Network and is also going to be on the upcoming family-friendly actual play podcast Autonomic from Cat Cool. Uh, super, super excited to see those projects come up to life. Liz was a great person to sit down and talk to. I've been a fan of her work since discovering her through the One Shot Network on her uh, guest appearances on the both campaign season one, the Star Wars story, and the random appearances she's done on One Shot Podcast. Uh, and I'm really kind of stoked to see what Kat is doing with Autonomic and this family-friendly version of actual play that Liz is going to be part of. You can find Liz on Twitter at Liz Anderson underscore underscore underscore. That's right. At Liz Anderson underscore 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 is where you find Liz on Twitter. Uh, I am super excited. This was such a great conversation. It took us a while to book it. Um, and, and, and then of course the, you know, I had, uh, internet issues the day that we were recording. So, um, what you guys heard took, took a long time for me to edit, to make sound good. So I hope you sit down and appreciate this conversation between Liz and I right here on everything is awesome on awesomepodcast.com and that entertains.com slash network. Quickly kind of, uh, go over who you are and then we'll, we'll talk about you and all the co- cool things you do. What a heady idea. <laughs> Um, so my name is Liz Anderson. I'm mainly a, a Chicago based, uh, comedian, writer, actor, kind of the whole thing. Um, I do a, a lot of improv and sketch comedy. I have, um, I'm a contributor for the onion for onion sports and for onion features. Um, I, and men, the most people on my Twitter feed would know me from all the guesting that I do on the One Shot Network for uh, a lot of RPG actual play stuff. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. It's hard to explain who you are when you don't really have a job. <laughs> well, and that's something that I and I don't know if it's recently. I'm gonna I'm saying recently. But uh, I, I, I guess within the last year, I think I noticed because I started following you on Twitter myself because of the, the one shot stuff. And, and that's what led me to finally asking you to be on the show. But you recently like don't have a, a day job like myself and do the like the, the freelance writing and, and comedy stuff. Correct. Yeah, it's been uh, the transition. 
I was lucky in the first few months uh, to land uh, a couple of like really good gigs that helped me bridge the gap between having a full-time corporate job at a major university versus just going freelance full-time. Uh, and that, but those came to a close as the projects came to a close. And now I'm really living the actual freelance life where you have to develop your own client base and invoice things and be responsible for like contracted work and that it's only just now becoming more difficult which is uh it's fine and it's a it's a good learning experience this just needs to give me i need to give myself a little kick in the pants to making it an actual workable career instead of just a summer vacation yeah i i feel like the like the dream of being the freelance no one ever thinks about like the downside of paying bills and uh yeah. all the work to like have work yeah it I, thankfully there are a lot of great resources for writing freelancers and even like uh, I don't know what it's like in other industries, but like great community organizations and um, especially like anyone who has a position with like an agency is more than willing to say, hey, they're they need people need writers here willing to share share the wealth. Um, but that's something that I'm kind of used to is treating yourself like a business. And that means like not doing the fun thing and that making sure that you know what your time is worth and you're setting your own time limits and working on the things you need to, but also like learning when to not work and like, have I done the equivalent of a full week's work right now? Should I be taking a break or should I just work the whole, the whole week and never stop? Um, because I also have like a couple part-time jobs, like in the actual physical world. So it, it's an interesting exercise in learning both what you're worth and also how to take care of yourself. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think that's why like I have never taken that plunge is that like that, that all that responsibility to, to be uh, an adult. And I, 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 when I have kids, I have two kids. So like now well, yeah. the, the fear to take that, that plunge. Uh, but when you have a family to support is even higher. So the, I, I, like I love when I see people like you and and then James when he went full time with uh, one shot, like it, it's like it, I'm happy that all these great people can do it and and like it's a I don't know I know there's some other creators out there that get really jealous over the fact that other people have like I guess the the fortune to to be able to do that but I always look I don't know, I'm Mister Positive and I kind of look at it as like uh, man I'm just happy for these like talented people that are like getting the time to do what they love. Yeah. That's also never a one to one. You I've always told people like who want to do the like jump full hog into their art. I tell them like wait a little bit. Make sure you have a lot of savings and you don't need to like quit everything all at once and then just be an artist living on your own in 2 weeks later. You can like I know that's what kind of James did like he started doing like one day off a week and he thankfully had an employer that would allow him to do that or it could even be something like you have a full-time job but um you're starting to develop a client base which means like doubling up your work for a little bit but you can like slowly onboard things yeah and I me I just don't sleep that's how I I, I just I keep the day job and <laughs> Sleep. And and I sleep two hours a night, three hours a night sometimes if I'm lucky. Jeez. <laughs> it's it's well, and that's all because like I'm in like my world is podcasting, so like it's mm -hmm. and and I finally like am to the point where I'm kind of limiting myself to maybe like one interview a week uh, versus during the Philadelphia Podcast Festival, like I did six a week. Um, that's so so much. <laughs> it's so much talk, which I love to talk, so it's not a big deal. But then it's the editing and it's the posting and it's every all the other work that comes with podcasting that's like, ugh. and that's why I sleep two to eh, three, four hours a night if I'm lucky. Um, and with kids, how old are your kids? My, my son is six and a half. My daughter is four. So uh, luckily, 
babies. Luckily, they're not babies anymore. Yeah, so they sleep through the night mostly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, every now and then they'll wake up for... And now it's to the point, like, if... And I purposely kind of do late night interviews just to kind of not have the clashing of bedtimes uh, with it. But I recently did an interview where my son at 11 o'clock at night came out uh, staggering into the room that I do my recording half asleep saying, can you give my teddy bear love? <laughs> and then, uh, which is adorable. And it's, and it's like, usually that stuff gets left into the podcast because I don't really care. Like it's just. No, part of the show very cute. yes yes uh and that's why i try to get that i try to get the uh the cuteness listeners in uh with those uh so that we have a, a bigger fan base but yeah it's um uh i'm very lucky in the sense that i kind of i took a couple years off from podcasting when they were babies because like they just when they were awake i needed to be dad yeah um so uh yeah you also do and i don't know if it's improv because i don't i guess i haven't uh followed the comedy side of things a hundred percent but it feels like like your your monthly show that you do is improv so you have a background in improv as well correct yeah uh it, it it's funny because like the world of chicago improv is very much like everyone kind of does everything everyone's like an actor or a writer or they say that they're an actor and a writer because like improv itself is not a career it's a skill um but so i started with comedy when i was in college i had i was part of a improv troupe at the university of florida and that's where i really caught the bug and i think they had like two or three older mentor type figures who were very they were interested in it in more professional sense and not necessarily and just like we're here to have fun they were like oh no we see career aspirations in this um so after college i moved up to chicago pretty quickly and that was not necessarily out of a desire to perform improv i it i I love improv but i'm not i don't think i'm any great genius at it um but i moved up to chicago mostly to like live in a big city but also kind of try my hand see i what i really wanted to do was be a writer okay um but then when i got up to chicago it's so easy to find yourself like everything is so accessible and that's the thing i love about chicago is that like if you have the smallest interest in meeting someone or uh like joining a certain group everything is like pretty close every like the people that you admire as improvisers are like they'll talk to you at the bar they're not gonna be any like no one's really a jerk or if they are they're secret jerks (laughs) um yeah so i spent i've been here since 2013 here in chicago and i've gone through all the improv programs Uh, i've gone through second city conservatory i've gone through io uh i am comedy sports is where i do most of my regular performing which is comedy sports if you're not familiar with it is like it's like whose line is it anyway short form games except with like the lay on of like oh it's a we're we're two competing teams and we wear jerseys uh which is very cheesy but also the people who are performing there are very very smart and very good like uh I know people tend to look down on short form improvisation, but honestly, it's the only kind of improv that makes money. Uh, And it's been a wonderful exercise working at that theater because it has regular audiences. Every other kind of improv theater you're playing, basically you're playing to other improvisers or other comedians. So you're trying to like, it, 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 it makes your performance like very self aware and more anxious, but I the I think the playing at comedy sports has helped me because it's kind of equivalent to stand up in that you're doing shows for everyone. There are tons like these are shows for children, these are oh, wow. shows for teenagers and like we'll get buyouts from like uh like retirement homes. You have to like it's just a show. It's like a family friendly show that is not for kids. Oh, okay. Is the way that we explain it. Um it it has been incredible training in how to have my own voice but how to tweak my voice so to make it appealing to any audience it needs to you know um 
<clears throat> and that that was huge for my development. I actually had um because I'm from Philly and our I feel like our creative arts scene is like in in like a huge like like blow up scene right now where uh we ha- like we've had a couple like bigger improv groups go out to I think like the big um Chicago festival out there and whatnot and I actually had a friend who uh is currently out I think at IO Chicago uh doing mm-hmm. some um uh, intensive uh classes and whatnot and yep, it's the intensive right yeah, yeah. uh and it's it, it's improv is so, like it's something that i i'm like so interested in that I, I just need to pull the trigger and it's i think it's right now what's holding me back uh from taking some classes in, in philly is like oh man i'm gonna be that weird like 34 year old in a classroom full of 20 year olds and uh oh you'd be surprised <laughs> So, so is it like are the classes like a mixture of young and I don't want to say old because 30s doesn't feel old, but, you know, like, uh, I, I guess definitely more adult than than child. You'd be surprised, honestly. It really depends on when mm-hmm. and where. Like the the thing about improv is now it's kind of a hip thing in the corporate world. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And honestly when people say there's no money in improv i say you've never done a corporate workshop because no one really knows like how to teach communication in a way that is useful and the closest they've ever gotten is to like improv workshops so what i've noticed in classes right now is like a huge influx of kind of like yuppies is the word (laughs) okay yeah uh and like like a huge range of ages because it's a lot of like people are coming around to it to improve communication yeah. skills really. uh in chicago i think we're kind of leaning more towards like the 20 somethings because like chicago is like 20 somethings will come here to to train um but in like silly cities like philly and i bet in in boston i think the ratio is a lot more like equivalent to regular population because you're going to get a wide range of experience frankly and people who just want to learn how to be on stage and not cry that kind of thing (laughs) yeah that's uh not crying not wanting to cry on stage is something that i've dealt with for because because my stage performance is only like live podcasting so it's not like i do any kind of actual acting or anything but for you know, our first live show I ever did for a podcast was like uh, almost 11 years ago and then took a long time off until about 2016 when we've been doing, you know, like three to, to six shows a year. And every single time, even though I've probably done now 12 to 18 shows, I still have the pre-show jitters where I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm going to bomb. I'm going to be awful. Yep. Uh, and I do want to cry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an awful experience. The good news is that it never goes away. Um, <laughs> yeah, it it's interesting. But the thing about like improv is like it, it sounds cheesy, but it is true. It does help you in like the real world. It helps me so much with job interviews oh, wow. because like I pretend like I'm just playing a character <laughs> and helping you like respond to conversation and be like uh like very intuitive in learning what your uh, interviewer wants to hear or wants to say or wants you to stay you to say it uh like i recommend it to anyone and i think that anyone can do improv what anyone can't do is do improv that's entertaining yeah you know it's it's uh, whenever i talk to uh, people who have done improv or studied improv it's kind of like the the common thread of it literally is a field that may you know at face value be for comedy but helps you in in everything like i talked to uh wrestler a couple wrestlers and and they have taken improv classes to help them on the mic or just help them in the ring or whatever and um and and it's it is it's it's something that i think is especially when you're doing a live performance even you know especially in a podcast where all you're doing is having random talking it's something that i definitely i personally have been threatening to do for three years and and probably will hopefully do uh within the next 12 months but um yeah it's it's an and a lot of my favorite performers 
now that I've been like focusing on podcasting and kind of like dabbling in at least like the knowledge of improv for the last couple of years, all have that background, like, you know, one shot with James mm-hmm. and, and you on, on campaign and the other podcast that I've, uh, like, well, let's talk about that. So you now, so, so what was your first experience with, with podcasting? Was it, was it the one shot network? Um, with me being on podcasts, probably. Yeah. Well, like the thing that I like to say is that every performer in Chicago either has a burlesque trip or a podcast. So <laughs> you could just, walk down the street and guest on someone's podcast um i think one shot is the first podcast i did that had like a okay. built-in audience already so that was a different experience um <clears throat> the i have had never played rpgs prior to doing my first one one shot episode and frankly i still don't the i've i don't think i've ever done a role-playing game like not on mic i don't think i don't i don't think that's ever happened um but the just over the past year my evolution into the like the one shot role playing space has been huge um and i'm pretty sure that has a lot to do with like knowing james and cat as friends and also like they what I think that they do in comparison to other actual plays is that all of their performers are actual performers. And I think that's the main difference. And I think the main uh, market appeal for them. Um, And so like, I'm very happy to be on these projects, but now I find myself like, Oh yeah, I'm on like 10 projects. (laughs) Well, and I, and I have, I've seen those like, uh, like the teases for those projects. Uh, where yeah. uh, obviously the, there's an evolution going on with campaign that you're part of and, and cats starting uh, something up. Is, can you talk about either of those projects? I think so, especially since I think cats sort of rolled out the announcement. So cats new project is going to be more geared towards um, kids and like kids. We mean like preteens. Um, it's more of a family friendly RPG experience that are mainly trying to get kids interested in uh in the the genre um campaign is going to be uh much more it's still similar to what old campaign used to be we're still playing in the genesis system we're still playing like with a, a party of four um or actually yeah it's, actually it's one more um but overall it's like it's not star wars anymore and it's not any uh existing ip we're creating the the ip so that'll be interesting to see um because i know that a lot of campaigns followership had to do with like the the world so um yeah it'll it'll be interesting so i've done recordings for camp we've started recordings for campaign um we're in the middle of a uh, cat's in like the middle of setting up the like the world book for her project so that we haven't started recording that yet but it'll be interesting but it's just like two years ago i had never <clears throat> never played a role-playing game and now i'm spending like legitimately 12 hours a week well and and that's um and i think i've seen you say it on twitter and, and I, you said it kind of at the beginning where like a lot of people that follow you are from that world uh uh, like for, like mm-hmm. from campaign and, and, and that's where they know you from. And that's, um, that's obviously where I picked you up from. And you are when like every guest, but you've done on any of those shows has been always like an hilarious experience. Uh, otherwise I wouldn't want to talk to you. Mostly screaming. Uh, <laughs> definitely screaming <laughs> but yeah you could, and, and your characters are like I, I like and i don't i forget which one it was but a lot of the, like the characters have like that um i picture in my head kate uh mckinnon from saturday night live um it is it has that like i don't know that tone I, it just reminds me of her mm-hmm. yeah that's what i like to do i like to uh i don't like being useful <laughs> <laughs> I like being like the the side character or the the annoying pipsqueak who can like chime in a lot. I if 
if there's ever like a dm that's trying to make me the protagonist i am actively trying to sabotage it because like i don't want to be i don't want to be the protagonist the protagonist has to like know things and do things (laughs) but maybe that's something that i need to just stretch in myself yeah and it's so with role playing like i'm i'm more of an active like uh listener of of those performances and, and like i i would definitely have listened to more than i've actually played um and it's it's mm-hmm. i would say i guess prior to you know to me really listening to them i only played a handful of times and continued and mo- i would say i've played more mm-hmm. on actual like i've guessed it on party of one podcast with jeff stormer uh, a few times i've probably played more mm-hmm. for a podcast than i have in real life yeah isn't that strange yeah yeah <laughs> it's and and like to the point where like someone i recently had on a guest was like oh by the way i do this uh actual play podcast that you should totally be part of i was like okay like sign me up um and sure. it's yeah it's a super uh it's such a fun format um even if you're like not a fan of role-playing games i always like i suggest them to any, anyone i know that just likes entertainment like and campaign's a pretty good example i think of uh I, i'm of like just um meaningful storytelling in in a silly fun way uh and uh, yeah i was uh, i was a guest oddly enough on a podcast that is also called everything is awesome uh but it's not my show <laughs> and huh. they they had this like section where you recommend a podcast and that was the podcast i recommended um uh and it's it's i also have a uh like the star wars canon uh me and my uh, my uncle bonded over when I was a kid and he was only like 16 years older than me. And then I, we lost him a few years ago to cancer. So like during, and that's when I first mm. discovered campaign. So like I have this huge emotional attachment to, to that story as well is why I also wax poetic about yeah. it a lot. But um, yeah, it's, it's mm-hmm. that format of storytelling through, through podcasting, I think is an experience anyone can enjoy, whether you like um, role playing games or not. Yeah, and that's I I started listening to campaign just as a fan too because it was like especially the first couple arcs were just so so fun and uh like I th- I loved the characters and I loved the for, for me it was a different experience cuz like I'm like hey I get to listen to my friends yeah, at yeah. work. Uh but uh, it, but like the like the way that they like told stories and uh the creativity that went into it and just like the, the saying yes and agreeing to like all the fun interesting things about these characters that's what i really enjoyed and i think that's what kind of what the best gms do is that they they tell beautiful visual stories and they've adapted the medium to audio and that and like the entire genre is exploding right now uh and that's i think that's another worry for us is that like well how do we compete with all these wonderful podcasts that are like creating music for their characters and beautiful arts like what do we do Uh, but i and i I think that the the one the advantage that at least um i assume campaign is going to continue forward with and you know, I cat's uh, project as well uh, is uh, a, there's an established fan base, I think for, for both a- and B yeah. the, I, I can't imagine that either project will run much differently than, than the current inca- incarnation of the campaign. And that I feel is still wholly unique. Um, there's not many actual plays that I listen mm-hmm. to that are, are are sound like campaign a lot of them still kind of are more heavy i think on the role-playing aspect uh, as far as like mechanics than the performance um so uh, like i i have i don't think there's one that i listen to that has as much performance as campaign uh and and the one shot series um and i listen to i I listen to quite a like a handful of them I love them all, but but that's what's unique, mm-hmm. I think, with what you guys have going on. Yeah, and and I totally agree with. I, I think that's definitely what sets those 
podcast per, apart yeah. is RPG as performance with a focus on that. And it like the one or two times that I've guested where there's the, one of the other guests is someone who like plays RPGs just casually. The difference between the way like me and Steve Kropa approach it is so different because we're like trying to like move as fast as we can and develop characters and jokes and bits as fast as we can versus like the actual yeah, game and of it. Th- like I'm, I don't know about Kropa. Yeah, and I think that's strategy. um I don't know that, that's that's a, a good I think thing that you guys have going and I'm su- like it's it's weird uh being in this place of uh like as a fan of campaign like waiting for the the end uh of the current thing especially since there's a, like a kind of like a heartwarming meaning behind it for me. Uh but uh, and also like kind of waiting and seeing the hints that um that James uh, has dropped on Twitter with the, the campaign Twitter and um, cats just dropped. I've only seen mm-hmm. one thing about what, what uh, like one or two tweets. Uh, yeah. That's the only thing she's done so far. So yeah. like, it's like, it's uh, as a fan, it's like kind of a cool place to be in uh, like a anticipation of what, what you guys have going on. Um, and it'll be very interesting for sure. And it's funny to be like kind of on both sides of both. <laughs> well, and, and but these are like now both projects uh, or at least campaign, I, I, I assume, um, is like going to be first full time podcast performance for you, correct? Yes. Yeah. The I've only ever done like the one offs with one shot. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. Like as I mean, I assume it is exciting as a performer to kind of have yeah. a, a regular gig. Yeah, absolutely. And like, a, I don't want to put a put a pin on it, but they're paid gigs, which is like, what? Oh, well, that's even better. <laughs> like, that's such a rare thing, I think. You know, at least from the podcasting side of the world, I can say that's such a rare thing. Oh, yeah. It's it's very rare. And also like for this. <laughs> You're giving me money for yeah, this? yeah, it's that's okay. what I, I um years ago. I was like a contracted guest host on a show. And um, mm-hmm. after the first like five week contract was up, they said, hey, by the way, here's your check. And do you want to sign up for more? And I was like, wait, I get paid to do pie like does this sit here and talk sure uh so it is i i've only had i've been lucky enough once for like maybe two or three years to get paid for talking uh and it is like such a cool rare experience um Mm -hmm. it and it's and furthermore it's even i think rare for like the um the the producer like the 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 jane the role that james is playing like to to Mm -hmm. offer that or to be able to offer that um yeah it's and it seems like um that like both he and and, and cat have that mindset of like we want to make sure we take care of our people yeah it's been like very comforting to know that because like i've i saw the the network grow from nothing to just being a regular podcast network to being like an actual company that can provide compensation like they keep on adding podcasts all the time and so it's been interesting to see because like seeing them like work out the kinks of how do we pay our performers like for both of bond for both podcasts i have contracts oh wow they have assigned like professional contracts of like with compensation and how compensation will grow as much as it, if if and when the patreon grows and uh like who owns the characters and yeah it's all very professional because it needs to be because there is a lot of like investment in it and a lot of like fan investment and actual fan money tied up in it so that's it kind of needs to be and yeah i I just i I, it's whenever i uh like look at how i i'm moving forward to do my own things like consistently one shot And I'm sure once Kat has more information about what she's doing, like all that stuff, like they're, they're the things that I look at as like inspiration. Like, all right, how are they running things? Because like, I really like what they're doing as a company and also as people. Yeah. It's a brand new industry and everyone is sort of figuring it out, but the people who are doing it the best are kind of 
covering all their bases as much as they can. The more they treat themselves like we are a business and we're going to continue to be a business in perpetuity. So they, you do all the right things to start with. And I think that's the main difference. We've talked a lot about uh, just things that you're involved with uh, and not necessarily, we didn't dive real deep into your, your monthly showcase that you do that I kind of want to, I want to get into. So um, do you do, do you do other things or is that right now like the only kind of show that you produce? That's the only show that I produce. I do like perform in like, I I have like weekly shows at comedy sports. um, And then sometimes I uh, will like, get small acting gigs but that's the only one show that i'm producing myself right now um it's called the one woman no show it's been kind of i think it's like my third year doing it um the basic concept is that every month i write a solo show it's about 45 minutes long or an hour um and then i have someone else perform it the only difference between but the the hitch there is that they we have someone else performing it, but the first time they've ever seen it is that night. They're cold reading the show that night and the show kind of blossoms around them. And uh, yeah, it, it has developed a lot over the years and it's one of my favorite things to do because it's often just like so silly and fun and interesting to see like how people react to something that they're not prepared for. Yeah. That is uh, a cool little twist is um and i think that's another thing that's kind of i've seen more and more lately like over the last you know half a decade maybe is like these performances that are like um scripted but unrehearsed uh that's like a a thing that i've seen um i don't want to say a lot of but definitely like yours was the first one that like grabbed my attention when just you promoting on twitter and whatnot uh, and, and I've seen a couple of other things, not necessarily, like, not exactly the same thing, but like the, the general sense of, yeah, like Shakespeare and the Hearst, yeah. Like that. yeah, so it's, it's a, it's like a neat performance, new performance that that's out there that, um, I'm excited to see how that grows. Yeah. It is frankly very fun to do. Um, people are better cold reading than they give themselves credit for. So, uh, um, Oh uh, yeah, I, I, I before you go further, how, so they are they literally on stage with the script in hand, or do they like so like literally? I'll bring them on stage, introduce them to the audience, and say, "Okay, here's yeah. your script. Do you have you ever seen this before?" They say, "No." Do you have any idea what's about to happen? They say, "No," and then we reveal the title of their show, and then they just go from there. And there's also like extra actors who've rehearsed a little bit. Well, who will play with them? It is broken up there's some parts that are more audience interaction based some more improvisational and overall it's telling like a short arc it's not it's not shakespeare it's not anything <laughs> fancy but it, like there's all, always like uh, some demon they need to fight and win against and then that's the end of the show but yeah uh it, it's people are better at it the people that are best at it are just people who are like fun and good in front of a crowd in the first place so now are the performances uh the, or i'm sorry the performers that you get for these are they all uh in the comedy scene improv or stand-up or otherwise or do you um get people that are like outside of that world sometimes um mostly in the improv and comedy scene because i know mm-hmm. them the best and how i can like what their skill set is Ideally, what I should be doing is trying to branch out into like Chicago figures and famous people and inviting people. Um, But that would involve like an actual producer. And (laughs) I'm just doing this on my own right now. Um, Probably the close. But I have gotten a few like pretty decent names. That's one. Once again, one of those great things about Chicago and its accessibility. Um, uh, I've had Katie Rich be a guest before she's a writer for snl um one of my favorite shows we did last year was with a wrestler called uh, yep. colt cabana he was just a delight a goddamn delight and talking about like showmanship and wrestling and improv like yeah it, it absolutely is a thing um yeah 
more than anything, like anyone can do the show. I just need to have an idea of like mm-hmm. what their comfort level is with different types of performance. Um, this I, that kind of opens up for a nice little segue because uh, Colt Cabana is actually I don't know if he's here yet, but he's actually in the Philly area for a podcast movement. He's hosting the yeah he's. I saw his Instagram. Yeah, he's there. Yeah, yeah. He's and I, I, I was um, doing research for a, a project of my own, and I saw that he was hosting the uh, the podcast awards that are that come yeah. along with podcast movement. So, uh, and I and I think I've seen you tweet some other things about wrestling. So, uh, you are uh, into wrestling, correct? Yes, sir. I don't really watch much of it anymore. Um, with I kind of fell off after having kids and whatnot, but. It's a world that I'm like, I, I like was in for a little while. I was trained by uh, Reckless Youth, Tom Carter, uh, King of the Independence at one point in the 90s, I believe. Uh, and we did it like we, we started out in the backyard and then um, and then went and got like in, in Pennsylvania. There is uh-huh. a lot of rules and regulations when it comes to wrestling, professional wrestling. And interesting yeah yeah and like and now i've actually looked into it again because i was like oh man if i can get back in shape i think my 34 <laughs> year old body can handle it again um <laughs> so i've been looking into like and we did everything wrong like we spent way more money than we had to but it's still like oh no you need a license like you need a a, a, a couple hundred dollars for a license you need insurance and to like set up your promotion yeah yeah and it's and it's not like in jersey you don't need any of that no of course not. yeah it's 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 and we like it was a such a learning experience like running a wrestling company 10 15 years ago when we when we went Mm -hmm. from backyard to that but um and we actually, and, and I, I mean, I don't do it anymore because I, I broke my ankle, not in wrestling. That was a drinking incident. Uh, <laughs> but after I broke my ankle, I kind of just fell away from it because the, the company was going in a different direction and uh, than, than I wanted to go. And mm. um, and I recently like started like losing weight and I was like, all right, well, if I'm losing weight, maybe, maybe I can do it. And I'm like starting to like get a hold of my context. And we actually, so like, and I still can't give it the, the same credit as Jeff Stormer does, but have you heard of Chikara? Yeah. Okay. That was the first wrestling show I ever saw. Yeah. So I, I recently just got into Chikara and I just talked to, uh, I, I recently had Mike Quackenbush on the show, uh, uh-huh. who, who is the co-founder and, and, uh, and it was like a, just a fun conversationalist uh yeah. super like super smart and, and whatnot but yeah chikara is like i love i i started watching it and i'm like all right well i can yeah. definitely see the the level difference between this and the wwe but the entertainment value i think personally yeah. is so much better than what like the wwe that, is currently offering yeah. they say that like wrestling is basically like anime yeah chikara is like the weirdest anime that you can find <laughs> It, it, yeah and i mean it's it's uh like, like comic book storylines and and i can see talking to the guy what's super interesting about shikara is it's it's like mike quackenbush solely running that whole thing and and kind of having really? final approval over everything and he is a big like i mean obviously as most adults do they they fall off comic books but he has strong roots in comic books yes yes and um i mean you you can definitely see it like just even if i've only watched maybe like one or two shows like i'm still like i recently signed up Mm -hmm. for their online thing and i'm going through like their back catalog and but Mm -hmm. just looking at like their seasons how they have it based is so influenced by comic books yeah and like real hardcore devotion to story yeah like some promotions are just like, well, oh, it's the heels and shoes. I still have yet to find this storyline. It's the one that I want to listen to the most, or not listen to, watch the most. Uh, that it involved time travel, and like I'm, that's my gimmick. Like I love time travel stories. Yeah. And and Jeff again, Jeff Stormer, who is a Philadelphia podcaster, has like this, like is in love with Jakar the way that like most people fall in love with people uh yeah and it, like i have yet to be able to to like find my old clip of him like talking about it. i think it's actually a clip that got lost early on in my podcast shows but um uh-huh. yeah he like the, the the way he described this like time travel story it jakar literally sounds like like the era of wrestling i grew up with which was like 
the the nineties of everything was a gimmick. Like there was yeah. there no everyone wore everyone didn't wear the same style of trunks, they didn't have real names, mm-hmm. they all had gimmicks. Yeah. Uh it, yeah. The I think the during the show that I saw, like me not knowing anything about any of the storylines, it had um both it had space monkey which of course is the the an actual monkey uh who wrestles uh and then like this huge huge tag like 12 on 12 tag team that ended with i don't i forget his name like the the like the mantis or something like that uh being rolled out in a wheelchair and something inspired and then him just rising up out of his wheelchair and pointing to someone in the ring and everyone screaming because of it. It's like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> I can't wait to like, I, I had the WWE subscription that I wasn't really watching at all. So I gave that up for the Chikara. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a, uh, and it, it's definitely like my gateway back into my gateway drug back into wrestling. Uh, because yeah. it is, it is just amazing uh so do you what do you do you follow like the the current stuff or no um yes i only got into wrestling like two two three years ago um so like my pov is very like skewed and it only happened because my roommate is a huge huge wrestling fan uh and pretty much anyone who's ever lived with him has just touched stonily become wrestling fans because it's always on and that's how they get you <laughs> gosh because it is a soap opera yeah. and you follow it's your stories and you find yourself invested in things and it's also like one of the coolest things about wrestling is finding out who else knows wrestling so if you like drop a reference and all of a sudden you you see someone at the uh end of the bar like perk up a little bit be like Ooh? and you yes me both of us yes <laughs> uh yeah so i i was able i started following like it's funny because like i started following wrestling when daniel bryant retired okay and then now he's back so it's all kind of come full circle to me um but yeah and so being in chicago is very easy to get caught up in the indie scene too Mm -hmm. because there's so many promotions that run in and out of here all the time um and so yeah like I like it because I like like the idea of pure showmanship. I love personalities and like it's like kind of like RPGs, like creating your own characters and living in the world of the characters you create for yourself. And everyone just kind of accepts like, yes, this is this man is pretending to be a bird. Yes, this we're all good with this. Uh, and yeah, it like WWE has its or like wrestling in general has its issues i i i feel very strongly about like promoting wrestler safety and like the way that women are treated but it's kind of like frankly wrestling is evolving faster than people give it credit for i think yeah i mean uh just from a standpoint of being like i was definitely i grew up a fan you know as a like as a preteen slash teenager so like i grew up in that that I don't really remember much from the late eighties, but like the late eighties, early nineties kind of stuff. And, but back Uh then it was like, it was a secret. You didn't tell people in school you watched wrestling. Uh, Otherwise you would get made fun of. (laughs) And um, I I remember like kind of as I was um, exiting high school, it kind of, and that was Oh two. So like in 2002 is kind of when I think it started to evolve beyond just like a small, kind of group of people um Mm -hmm. and where it was kind of getting cool to to be a fan of wrestling kind of like it was kind of cool to be a fan of uh star wars and comic books like that just like as i exited my and and started going to it being an adult is when it was okay to let people know you did that and but i remember being like sitting in like in an english class and like same thing that you, you described just a few minutes ago where someone said something i was like yo do you watch and like you had to be under your breath you had to say do you Dang. watch wrestling <laughs> and uh and it was and, and like those are the people that i like we bonded with and started wrestling in the backyard like that's why backyard wrestling existed uh back, i don't know mm-hmm. if it exists today i'm sure it does it has to but i'm sure it does back then it existed because no one 
no one liked wrestling except for your small group of friends. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's so interesting to come to it late in the game and talk to people who have been wrestling fans for their whole lives. Cause it's like you, it's the same old discussion of like possession and like fandom becoming like it could either go one of two ways it could either be very accepting and knowledge sharing or it could be very toxic and like wrestling can have some of the nicest most wonderful people but it can also have some of the most toxic fans you've ever ever seen in any genre so yeah it, it it's yeah. I, I, and i like that what you said earlier about there being kind of like an evolution with with wrestling and it is like it as much as as much work as that industry needs uh to to just be better um it is it has come such a long way in the you know i I think the last time i wrestled was in 2009 so that's kind of probably like when i had like a huge finger uh in the industry and what Mm -hmm. was going on so even like in those in that less than a decade that um the industry has like changed so much for the better and while WWE, I think, is, is you know, there's an issue with them kind of being the go-to be-all for it. Um, mm-hmm. They are, like, you know, with, with it seems like having Hunter and uh, Stephanie kind of running the show, it seems like they are doing I, I, things for the better. Uh, you know, pushing yeah. the women's division with- beyond a 30-second match. Yeah, pushing the women's division, like, also promoting, like, kind of, like, body diversity in the wrestlers and just regular diversity in the wrestlers like they're still not great things they're still like doing shows in saudi arabia for millions of dollars and they're still uh like some making bad decisions but those most of the time it's kind of like more often than not they're trying to make the right decisions and that trickles down to the independents mostly and and uh, that's what i think matters Mm -hmm. um and the fact that like independent wrestling is becoming profitable and there's more of i uh like less of a monopoly i think i think that's also helping like it behooves people to behave better yeah and it is neat seeing the the independent scene go through like another boom it had like a you know probably 20 years ago had a nice little boom, but now I think it's had its biggest boom that it's ever had. And it's weird because living in the Philly area and nothing has really changed because Philly is a big wrestling town and uh, it's always kind of been here. Like it's never like the independency never left here. Like it, like it had maybe other, uh, other towns, but seeing how like, like Cody Rhodes, for instance, can go out and, literally make more money than he was in the wwe um yeah. it's great but he's so much money. uh like all in in chicago in september is going to be huge like we've got tickets to it it's going to be enormous it's like a huge independent wrestling promotion that sold out a ten thousand seat theater yeah it's gonna be yeah it's gonna be incredible and, and, and when i like that news obviously came across probably my Twitter feed or something and, and seeing that come across and seeing that like they were able to sell that out uh, is incredible. Gosh. Yeah. So it's like the, and then there's the question of like, is it more popular because it is kind of less safe? Are they taking care of their people, especially with like, recent like takahashi recently get, getting his neck broken by like it, it's the same old like punk rock aesthetic like we still need to take care of our people but i think overall it's uh, the rising tide lifts all boats one yeah, would hope yeah um I, I i'm super excited for for it, like getting back into that industry with chikara and and hopefully maybe i'll let that allow me to expand into other things especially like my six-year-old my son is kind of into it now i i'm wary of letting him get too much into it because i know how dangerous I, it was when i was in it and i you know when when you're when you when you were uh wrestling in the backyard there's literally uh, we were as safe as you could, but literally no safety net. So, no, of course not. <laughs> like I, I always kind of took pride in the fact that we were 
the the uh, backyard federation that made sure we like some of us had some training. We were safe. We built a ring, uh, and and we for ninety five percent of the the backyard time we had were the the federation that did not light tables on fire. There was just that one time that someone lit a t- table on fire. I was like. Why? Why are we doing this? This is a bad idea. Uh, it was just the one, the one time, you know. It's um, yeah. I, it's it's. Uh, I feel like it's an exciting time to kind of be uh, a fan of pretty much anything. Like everything doesn't have like a, a stigma with it anymore. Like anime and wrestling and comic books. Yeah. Like it's all okay to be a fan of. No one really hates you anymore. If or or thinks you're an outcast if you're a fan of this stuff. Mm. it's like also like the fan bases of things people are just generally growing up and like i also think this is kind of heady uh but we're kind of in like a post ironic Mm -hmm. era where especially with like the way politics is and the way that like the world is going we're allowing ourselves to just enjoy the things that we enjoy earnestly and just be like fuck it i love Oh, I, I don't care i'm gonna tell everybody i this is the thing that i like what do you like because we have so few like joys in <laughs> in the in the real yeah, world yeah. no it is it, 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 and i think that's like um the 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 how shitty the world is uh specifically maybe america right now uh it, it's like the perfect time to just like be as positive as you can be uh and just have as much fun as you can because like any anything can literally trigger you to want to cry uh so it's yeah it it is uh a weird time i think but it's you know as far as like nothing that's too serious i think it's a great time to to you know appreciate the things that we have and that's the way like i think entertainment's gonna go entertainment is not gonna become like less serious entertainment is just going to divide itself into like very very serious pointed entertainment or like entertainment with a purpose or just absurd entertainment absurd earnest entertainment that is serving as a release i don't think there's going to be any middle ground anymore like satire isn't really going to be powerful because it's kind of like the world is so satirical in the first place it's kind of like well what are we trying to teach people here that it's bad we know it's bad um all right uh on on that note uh it's it's been just about an hour so before i officially let you go uh a thank you for doing the show and uh working through uh the minor voice issues i see voip errors all over the place (laughs) so thank you for dealing with through all that i'll make it sound pretty in post-production i promise uh, you sound um, great. But uh and also uh make sure uh you let people know where they can find you and what you got going on and all that fun stuff. Uh main place to find me is on Twitter. I recently changed my handle so I'm easier to find. It's at Liz Anderson underscore underscore <laughs> underscore. Uh gosh, that, that was the only way. That was the only way. Um and if you're ever in Chicago, I appear weekly at Comedy Sports Chicago. I don't know what my schedule is uh, more than a week ahead of time. So just let me know if you're in town. I can get you a comp. Uh, my next one woman no show is going to be on August 10th at Comedy Sports Chicago. I am also... Um, what else is going on? I'm also uh, I'm also hireable. <laughs> so if you, need, <laughs> if you need any copywriting done, please let me know. Thanks, Liz, for being on the show. Make sure you follow her on Twitter at Liz Anderson underscore underscore underscore. Again, that's at Liz Anderson underscore underscore underscore. And stay tuned to at Campaign Pod and at Autonomic Pod for updates about the new seasons and the series debut for those shows. Uh, and of course, check out the One Woman No Show every second Friday at the Comedy Sports Theater in Chicago. Uh, Liz is a very, very funny, talented comedian. We have a new show on the network. Take a listen to Superhero Movie Cast on thatentertains.com slash network, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. Superhero Movie Cast follows host Thomas Olsen and guests reviewing and analyzing inspiring themes from superhero movies. We'd like to end everything as awesome with a call to action. Super friends, there are a lot of terrible things happening right now, and it can feel like you can't do anything to help, but you can. It takes people like us to make a difference, and one of the easiest and most important ways to take action is to call your representatives about issues that are important to you. Brett Kavanaugh is bad for women's rights. It is clear that he is an opponent 
of reproductive rights, especially access to abortion care and birth control. In 2015, he authored a dissenting opinion in the D.C. Circuit's ruling of the Affordable Care Act's birth control benefit, writing that he believed employers have the right to deny employees health insurance coverage for birth control. Birth control is a right. Abortion care is a right for all women. Uh, it, it's just basic human. They have every say over their body. He is also bad for voting rights. There's strong evidence that if confirmed Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh will do his best to weaken and dilute voting rights. In 2011, South Carolina passed a voter ID law, which the Obama administration blocked after determining it could disenfranchise tens of thousands of minority voters who are more likely than whites not to have IDs. When South Carolina sued in federal court, Kavanaugh wrote the opinion upholding the law, saying that it was not discriminatory nor violating the Voting Rights Act. It is. There is no reason that you need anything but the proof that you're 18 to vote. Uh, and this is a basic right we have as Americans, that every American citizen has a right to vote. When I call my reps, I use a site called 5calls.org. That's the number 5calls.org. There, you'll find issue summaries of issues that are important to you, contact info for your representatives, and a script to read while you're on the phone to make sure your message gets across. Calling is quick, easy, and is one of the most important ways to have your voice heard. It can make a tremendous difference. Let your voice be heard. Thank you to our supporters on patreon.com slash that entertains. If you want to support us in a non-monetary way, word of mouth recommendations and five-star rating reviews on iTunes are the best way to spread the good word of awesome. You can find us on at real awesome pod on facebook.com and Twitter. You can also find us on Instagram at awesome podcast and we're available on awesomepodcast.com And of course that entertains.com slash network. You can get more news about this show at awesomepodcast.com and that entertains.com. But but also on my personal Twitter at that nerdy Kev is where I do a lot of things. If you're interested in ad rates, live appearances, help with your podcast, or have a question or comment, email us at awesome at crudehumorstudios.com. Everything is awesome is a production of That Entertains Podcast Network in association with Crude Humor Studios. Crude Humor Studios is a Philadelphia-based production company specializing in audio. You can find more information at crudehumorstudios.com. Thanks for listening, super friends. We've been awesome. That's entertainment podcast network. Entertainment and culture. Artist owned, fan supported.